Okay, today we're going to talk about the statement of cash flows. We've been avoiding this topic all semester long or all period long, whatever this happens to be. And we don't introduce, we, we briefly mention the statement of cash flows at the beginning of accounting 101, financial accounting. But we kind of dodge a further discussion because it, it's, at that point, it's just too soon to talk about cash flows. It's kind of a confusing financial statement. Uh, but it's an important piece of the picture because accrual-based accounting, which is what we use, that's what GAAP requires to prepare our income statement and balance sheet, is based on revenue recognition and the matching concept. Okay, and so accrual-based accounting, which is how we calculate net income, does not mean it's the same as how much cash did we actually receive. Okay, and when you look at the financial statements of companies like Microsoft and Intel and Google and Apple and all these other companies, you look at their net income on the income statement, and then you look at the cash flows that are provided by their operations, and these are significantly different numbers. So the question is, what is the difference? And in essence, the difference is the cash flow statement uses cash basis accounting. And that's what we're doing. We're kind of converting from accrual-based net income back to the cash basis. Now let's look at the slide here. The statement of cash flows, which I abbreviate SCF, there's two different ways in which we can prepare this. There's the direct method and there's the indirect method, okay? We're going to focus on the indirect method in this lecture. First, we have three parts or three sections of the statement of cash flows. We've got the operating activity section, we have investing activities, and we have financing activities. By the way, note the bottom. Cash, when we say cash, it's implied that we're talking about cash and cash equivalent. Okay, we said that in a previous lecture, a cash equivalent is something like a certificate of deposit or a money market account or a U.S. Treasury bill that's going to mature in three months or less, which means we're going to get our money back, very low investment risk, very low interest rate risk, and very easily converted to cash, very liquid. That's what a cash equivalent is, okay? And when you look at any balance sheet and you see the first line item in current assets is cash and cash equivalent. So when we talk about cash and cash flows, it is implied that we're including cash equivalents. Okay, now, one of the things you need to do as a student is to be able to differentiate an operating activity from an investing activity from a financing activity. And here's how you draw that distinction. When we look at transactions and events, if the transaction involves a revenue account or an expense account, and we know that revenues and expenses are on the income statement, it's an operating activity. If a transaction involves current assets or current liabilities, it's an operating activity, okay? So revenues, expenses, current assets, current liabilities, any transaction involving those accounts, operating activity. If a transaction involves a non-current asset, such as long-term investments, property, plant, and equipment, or intangible asset, that's an investing activity. And financing activities are transactions involving non-current liabilities, such as notes payable, bonds payable, mortgage payable, as well as stockholders' equity account, common stock, preferred stock, okay, dividends, treasury stock. Okay, so you need to be able to distinguish or differentiate a financing transaction or activity from an investing from an operating activity, okay? Now, this is the statement of cash flows. When we say flows, it means receiving actual cash, inflows, or what we call sources of cash, or outflows, when we make a payment or a disbursement, a use of cash. So inflows, outflows, cash flows in, cash flows out, that's what we're talking about. Okay? So this is the order in which we present them. First we present operating activities, then investing, then financing. Okay? Now, briefly, the only difference between the direct method and the indirect method is how we prepare the operating activity section. 
under either method, investing and financing activities is presented identically. So it's only the operating activities that is differently presented. And we're going to focus again on the indirect method. Okay. What does the statement of cash flows accomplish? What are its objectives? Let's take a look. Okay, it shows us where, actually, where cash actually came from and where it went. How do we receive it? How do we use it? Okay? It shows us the difference between net income, which uses accrual-based accounting, and income under the cash basis of accounting. When we see cash provided by operations or cash provided by operating activities, can be called either one, that's really income under the cash basis. It helps people who are potential creditors or investors or vendors or customers, whoever, to evaluate our ability to pay our bills as they come due, pay back loans and interest, pay dividends, reinvest in replacing old equipment and machinery. Okay? And so uh, it helps to evaluate the liquidity and, and overall solvency of a business. And last, it literally shows us why our cash balance changed from what it was on January 1st to what it was on December 31st. That difference between those two numbers will be explained by the statement of cash flows. Okay, so these are our objectives. <clears throat> okay, the hardest part of the statement of cash flows is preparing the operating activity section. Okay, so we're going to focus more time on this. All right, the first thing we do is we take net income right off of the income statement, and that's the first line item. And we're going to convert net income to cash from operations, or cash provided by or used by operating activities. Okay? So, the first thing I wanted to do is talk about the concept of depreciation. And notice that we add back depreciation expense and amortization expense. The question is, why do we do this? Let's look at an example. Let's suppose I have revenue of $10,000 and it was all received in cash. No credit, no accounts receivable. And I have expenses of $6,000. And again, we paid all our bills in cash. I don't have any outstanding accounts payable related to my expenses. And I also have depreciation expense, which I'm going to abbreviate, of $3,000. Okay? Now, I take my revenues minus my expenses, and this gives me net income of $1,000. So on the income statement, I would report net income of $1,000. However, if you think back to your property, plant, and equipment chapter, when we record depreciation, I'm going to put the journal entry down here, we debit depreciation expense, in this case for 3000 and I'm going to abbreviate, we credit accumulated depreciation for 3000 Notice, I did not credit cash. I'm not going to cut a check. I'm not paying anyone for depreciation. When I record rent expense, I have to pay rent with cash. When I record wage expense, I have to pay my employees' wages. When I pay for utility expense, cash. Insurance expense, cash. At some point, you've got to pay these bills in cash. Depreciation expense and amortization. We, remember, we amortize intangible assets like patents and copyrights. Those two expenses, depreciation and amortization, are what we call non-cash expenses because we debit the expense, and in the case of depreciation, I credit accumulated depreciation. In the case of amortization expense, I'll credit either the patent account or the copyright account. I might even credit accumulated amortization, but I'm not crediting cash because I'm not paying any cash. So that's what's called a non-cash expense. So really, even though I have net income of $1,000 in my example, my cash, excluding anything else, just working off this data, I really have $4,000 cash. Okay? So notice on the screen, on the PowerPoint slide, I have to add back depreciation expense if I have it, as well as add back amortization expense because they're an expense that reduce net income. Expenses reduce net income. 
but they don't require us to pay cash. Okay, so that's the first adjustment to net income. The second adjustment, notice I put uh, add or subtract a gain or a loss on the sale of property, plant, and equipment. Let me give an example to illustrate this. Let's say I have equipment and it cost me $100,000. And I have the ar related accumulated depreciation. And so far, this asset, it's, it's getting old. I've recorded 85,000 of accumulated depreciation. Then you may recall my book value is $15,000, which is simply cost minus accumulated depreciation. And again, book value is what we report on the balance sheet when we prepare financial statements, and it simply represents the portion of the cost that has not yet been written off as a depreciation expense. Now, suppose I sell the equipment for $20,000 cash. Okay, so I sell the equipment for 20,000 cash. Here's my journal entry to record this. I'm gonna debit cash for $20,000. Remember, once we sell the equipment, we have to remove it from the general ledger. So I'm gonna credit property, plant, and equipment, or just the equipment account, either way, for $100,000. If I no longer have the equipment, I no longer have accumulated. So I got to get rid of the accumulated account as well. Okay, so I'm going to debit accumulated depreciation for $85,000. And then notice, I compare my proceeds. My proceeds is the cash I receive to the book value. And since I received more than the book value, I'm going to record a gain on sale of the equipment, in this case for $5,000. And you saw this just a few lectures ago. Okay, when we sell equipment, we may have a gain or we have a loss when the proceeds is more or less than what the book value is. If we sold this for less than $15,000, I would have a loss on sale. Notice how a gain is a credit, which is like revenue. A loss would be a debit, and that's like an expense. Okay, so here's where things get a little confusing. Equipment is a non-current asset. Okay, so think back to one or two slides. Non-current assets, transactions involving non-current assets, that's an investing activity. Therefore, in the investing activity section of the statement of cash flows, I'm gonna put Sold equipment, 20,000 cash, that's a receipt of cash, what we call an inflow or a source of cash. I sold the equipment, they gave me 20 grand. Additionally, if you think back to the multi-step income statement, gain on sale gets reported on the income statement in that other revenue and expense section, below operating income. Therefore, if it's on the income statement, that gain on in sale of 5,000 increase, I'm sorry, I'm pointing the wrong direction, uh, to it increase my net income. Okay, so it's included in net income on the income statement. Now, back to the investing activity section, I have this line item, literally, sold equipment for cash, 20,000. That $20,000 is my $15,000 book value plus my $5,000 gain, right? I received 20 in cash, I have a gain of five. So the 20,000 includes that gain on sale. But the gain on sale is also reported in net income. It's being counted twice. It's being double counted. Because it's being double counted, we have to remove it from somewhere. And using GAAP, since we sold equipment, which is a non-current asset, the decision is that this is an investing activity, so we're going to leave it in investing activities, but 
I'm going to subtract the gain on sale from net income in the operating activity section. I know it seems like we're doing the opposite of what we should be doing, but since it's been double counted, I subtract the gain on sale from net income in the operating activity section. If we had a loss on sale, it's the opposite. Okay, let's just modify our journal entry. Let's assume the following, that instead of selling it for 20,000, we sold it for $10,000. So I debit cash, 10,000. I credit equipment, I debit accumulated, and I'm gonna debit loss on sale for the $5,000 difference between the book value and the proceeds, the selling price. Okay, now this one's a little bit harder to visualize, which is why I always show the gain on sale in my example. But loss on sale reduces net income. It's on the income statement, so it's in net income. We've already reduced net income by 5,000. In the investing activities, that loss is reflected in the fact that I had a book value of 15, but I only received 10,000 in cash. So 15 minus the 5,000 loss, proceeds of 10,000. Again, that's harder to see, but we are double counting that loss on sale. And so therefore, in the operating activity section, we add back the $5,000 loss on sale, okay? So you do one or the other. You either have a gain or a loss. If it's a gain, I subtract it. If it's a loss, I add it back. Kind of weird, but that's what we do. Okay, after those adjustments, we have to analyze our current assets and our current liabilities. Okay, so first we're gonna look at current assets, and for my example, I'm gonna look at accounts receivable. Okay, now let's assume that on January 1st, my beginning balance was $50,000. And at the end of the year, on December 31st, I had $40,000. And this, let's just assume that sales for this year equaled $600,000. This number really doesn't matter, but I wanna, I wanna build my example and hopefully it makes some sense to you. So during the year, I debited accounts receivable for 600,000 and I credited sales revenue for $600,000. Now, not all at once, but you know, in a, a, a series of, of transactions. So now remember, this beginning balance was last year's ending balance. When the clock strikes midnight, December 31st becomes January 1st. So this is really last year's ending balance, which means that last year I debited accounts receivable and I credited sales revenue. So this is part of last year's sales but I'm gonna collect it this year. In addition to this, I added an additional $600,000 of accounts receivable. So, during the course of the year, I was owed by my customer $650,000. Okay, so they owe me collectively 650, but at the end of the year, they only owe me $40,000, I must have collected the difference, which is 610,000. Debit cash, 610. Credit accounts receivable, 610. And I'm gonna post the credit to the accounts receivable account. And that explains how I went from 650 down to 40. Now, if sales instead of being 600,000, if it had sales had been 700,000, then 50 plus seven is 750. If my ending balance is 40, I would have collected 710,000. If sales had been 800, this would be 850, and I would collect 810. In other words, it doesn't really matter what this year's sales were. To figure out what the effect is 
on the statement of cash flows, all I have to do is I just have to compare the beginning balance to the ending balance. And this is a little bit counterintuitive. It seems like it's going in the opposite direction. But when accounts receivable decreases, it's because I collected additional cash. So if revenue was 600000 we know that on the income statement, revenue minus expense equals net income. Net income was based on $600,000 of revenue, but I actually collected $610,000. I collected $10,000 more than I reported as revenue on the income statement. Therefore, all I have to do is look at the beginning and ending balance, and since it decreased by $10,000, I would add the amount of the decrease in accounts receivable of $10,000 to net income, okay? So I add the decrease in accounts receivable, and it doesn't matter if it's accounts receivable or supplies or inventory or prepaid insurance, whatever current asset, it, they all behave the same way. And so if they decreased in value, it's because we converted an additional amount to cash. So I add the decrease, 10,000 in my example, to net income. Okay? Now, suppose instead of the ending balance being 40, it was 60. Sales for the period was 600,000, so they owed me 650. If they still owe me $60,000, then I must have only collected 590,000. Just check the math. Debit cash, 590. Credit accounts receivable, 590. So I reported revenue as 600,000 on the income statement, but I only collected 590. I collected $10,000 less cash than I reported on the income statement. So net income, which was based on 600 of revenue, but in the cash basis, I only collected 590. Therefore, I simply compare the beginning and ending balances. And if it increased, as it did here by 10,000, I subtract the increase in accounts receivable or the increase in any current asset. OK, a little unusual. And that's what we do. OK, so add a decrease in current assets from beginning to end of the year. Subtract an increase in current assets. Let's take a look at current liabilities. For example, let's say we have wages payable to our employees. And this is a liability credit balance. And at the beginning of the year, we owed them $30,000. And at the end of the year, December 31st, excuse me, I owe them $25,000. And this year, wage expense for the year was, we'll say, $200,000. OK? So during the course of the year, we debited wage expense for $200,000. And we credited wage payable for 200. Now remember, we pay our employees every week or twice a week or once a month. So this would have been a series of journal entries. This is simply the collective effect. Same thing. Debit, uh, excuse me, credit wage payable. So during the course of the year, I owed my employees $230,000. Now. Let's go back to the beginning balance for a moment. We know that the beginning balance for this year is last year's ending balance, which means last year I debited wage expense, credited wage payable for $30,000. So this $30,000 was from last year's wage expense. But I'm going to pay it to my employees this year. So it's a cash flow for this year. Okay? 
So I owed them 230. At the end of this year, I still owe them 25,000. So I must have paid them the difference, which is 205,000. Okay, when you pay off a liability, you debit the liability, in this case wage payable, 205,000, and I credit cash, $205,000. Now, let's go back to the income statement. Revenue minus expense equals net income. We reduced net income by $205,000, excuse me, I, let me take that back. We reduced net income by the $200,000 wage expense, but we actually dispersed, we paid in cash, $205,000, okay? So again, net income was reduced by 200, but I actually spent 205,000. I spent an additional $5,000 cash. So I have $5,000 less cash than net income suggests that I have. Therefore, if my current liability decreased, as it did here, I subtract the decrease. Again, it doesn't really matter what this year's wage expense was. I simply compare beginning and ending balances. Remember, if wage expense instead of 200 had been 300, then this number would be 330, and it means I would have dispersed 305. Had expense been 400, this would be 430, this would be 405. It doesn't matter what this year's expense was. I simply have to look at the beginning and ending balances for wage payable. If it decreased, it's because I dispersed an additional amount beyond what this year's expense was. So, since I spent more, I'm going to subtract that difference. In this example, $5,000. I would subtract $5,000 from net income for the decrease in wage payable or any current liability. <clears throat> Suppose instead my ending balance had been $35,000. Okay? Began with $30,000 being owed to my employees. <clears throat> wage expense was $200. I owed them $230. If I still owe them 35,000 at year end, it means I must have dispersed 195,000. Okay, debit wage payable, credit cash. Okay, for $195,000. Okay, on the income statement, I reduced net income by 200,000 but I only dispersed 195. I have $5,000 more cash than net income is reporting. Because we subtracted 200 of wage expense, but I only dispersed 195. Therefore, because wages payable increased, I'm gonna add that $5,000 increase to my cash to get from net income to actual cash provided by operating activity. So you've got to kind of think this through a little bit and play with it. Okay, but I'm going to give you a little technique here, okay? And in accounting, as in any other class, it's always preferable that you understand the process, but sometimes you, you can apply test-taking techniques to simply survive the experience, so to speak, especially you non-accounting majors out there. So for the current assets and current liability, if you remember the first line, add a decrease in current assets. You may not understand it. I hope you do, but you may not. <clears throat> well, I kind of, what I call flip-flop my way through the remaining three lines. I think, okay, I add a decrease in current assets. Not sure why, but I do. I guess I must subtract an increase <clears throat> in current assets. And if you remember that current assets and current liabilities kind of go in the opposite direction. They do the opposite thing. <clears throat> Notice, since I added a decrease in current assets, I guess I'll do the opposite. I'll subtract a decrease in current liabilities. <clears throat> and since I subtract an increase in current assets, I'll do the opposite. I'll add an increase in current liabilities. 
Now again, hopefully my examples made a little bit of sense to you, but if they didn't, try to remember that, memorize one line of those four, and you kind of work your way, you flip-flop through your other three, and you will actually come up with the correct number. Okay, so the operating activities section, which is definitely the hardest part, we start with net income from the income statement. We add back any depreciation expense and or amortization expense. If we had a gain or a loss on sale of property, plant, and equipment, or any long-term asset, non-current asset, I would subtract the gain on sale, or I would add the loss on sale back, because we're double counting. It's already reported in the investing activity section, but since that number is already included in net income, we have to kind of back it out. Okay, so again, subtract a gain, add back a loss. And then we analyze all of our current assets, and we follow these four rules here, okay? Analyze current assets, then we analyze our current liabilities, and that gives us cash provided by, assuming it's a positive number, or if it's a negative number, cash used by operating activities, okay? So if it's positive, we say cash provided by operating activities, or simply cash from operations, that's acceptable or cash used by operations if it's a negative number. Okay, let's move on. <clears throat> the next section is the investing activities section, which deals with transactions involving non-current assets. And we really have three primary categories of non-current assets. Long-term investments like stocks and bonds, maybe you invested in land for speculative purposes or property, plant, and equipment, which we've talked about. And we know that if land is being used to help run our business, it's part of property, plant, equipment. But if we just bought some raw land for investment purposes, it's a long-term investment. And intangible assets, patents, copyrights, uh, goodwill, trademarks, etc. And this is the easiest of the three sections because you either bought one of these or you sold one of these. Those are the only two options we have. If you purchased a new asset or whatever, you just purchased an asset, we spent cash. We used cash. It's an outflow. So you put purchase of equipment, $50,000, negative. Put brackets around it. If we sold one of these assets, I sold some uh, bond investments for $70,000. That's a source of cash, money coming in. So that's a positive number. Sold bonds, sold equipment for whatever. And that's a positive number. Okay? So however many transactions you had relating to investing activities, okay, you bought this, you bought that, you sold this, you sold that, you add up, subtract all those various numbers, and you either have a positive number or a negative number. If it's a positive number, cash provided by investing activities. If it's a negative number, cash used by investing activities. Pretty straightforward section, okay? And then last, we have the financing activity section, okay? And again, this involves non-current liabilities and stockholders' equity accounts. So we broke it down into money coming in or inflows or sources of cash and money going out, outflows or uses of cash. Issue stock, whether it's common stock or preferred stock, we're raising money, raising capital. That's a source of cash, positive. I issued a bond or I issued a note payable. Again, I'm borrowing money, source of cash. I bought back treasury stock. Remember, that's common stock previously issued that I bought back, use of cash. I paid back a note payable or a bond. And sometimes they use the word redeemed bonds or even retired bonds. So again, redeemed or retired is the same as paying back. That's a use of cash. If I pay my stockholders dividends, cash dividends, not stock dividends, cash dividends, that's a use of cash. Okay, so you add up the positives, you subtract the negative numbers, add the inflows, subtract the outflows, and whatever number you come up with is either cash provided by or cash used by financing activities. Again, this, these last two sections are much more straightforward. Operating activities is the one that gets a little weird. Okay, so we're gonna actually do an example now, clear the board, of how to prepare a statement of cash flows, okay, 
using the indirect method. Again, the indirect method. Okay, so we have this information here. Okay, we have net income, we've got depreciation expense, and we sold the equipment with a book value of $20,000 for $28,000. And then we have these current assets and current liabilities. We're going to calculate the operating activity section. Okay, so here's the operating activity section. Okay, we start with net income of $100,000. Depreciation expense, we said, is a non-cash expense. It did not require an outlay. So I'm going to add depreciation expense back to net income, $30,000. Okay, I sold a piece of equipment. For $28,000, its book value was $20,000. So I received $8,000 more than its book value. Okay, two things. I'm going to report in the investing activity section. That's going to be sale of equipment, $28,000 positive. And on the income statement, I had gain on sale, $8,000. That $8,000 gain is already in net income. It's being double counted. So I'm going to subtract the gain on sale of equipment, $8,000. Okay, then I have to analyze my current assets and current liabilities, and here you need to be careful, because there's a couple of a little traps you can fall into. First, the entire statement of cash flows objective, one of the objectives, is to explain the difference between beginning cash and ending cash. We began with 21,000, we ended with 150. That's what the entire three parts is trying to explain. So don't analyze the cash account. Do not analyze the cash account separately in the operating activity. Okay? Because that's what the entire statement is trying to explain. So let's go to accounts receivable. We began with 50, we ended with 40. AR decreased. It's current asset, so think back. I add the decrease in accounts receivable for $10,000. I converted some additional uh, cash, sales into cash. Inventory, which is also a current asset, increased from 70 to 85. I subtract the increase in inventory because it's a current asset. Okay, 15,000. Counts payable, wage payable, current liabilities. Counts payable went from 35 down to 33. It's a decrease of 2,000. Okay, so the decreased, I spent additional money, so I have less cash. I'm going to subtract the decrease in accounts payable, 2,000, and Wages payable increased by 6000 Okay? So when a, a current liability increases, it's because we recorded an expense this year on the income statement, but we're not going to pay it till next year, so I add back that increase. Okay, and this gives me cash provided by, since it's a positive number, had it been negative, it would be used by, operating activities. And let's see, let's do the math here quickly. 141.32. I believe it's 121,000. We'll look at our slide momentarily. I'm going to do math in my head here. Indeed it is. $121,000, okay? Now, if we go back to the previous slide, okay, $121,000, okay? Actually, I'm sorry, I need to go forward here a little bit. Okay, that's the cash provided by operating activities. Now, we would also have investing and financing activities. And let's just assume we said we sold equipment for 28000 This is a source of cash. OK? 
Okay, so I put 28,000. We also purchased a truck. I have to provide you with this additional information. We purchased a truck for 90,000. That's a use of cash. If there were no other investing activities, then I would put cash used by investing activities, 62,000. And notice it's a negative number, cash used by. Okay? So we have, going back, sorry, cash provided by operating activities, positive 121,000. Cash used by investing activities, 62,000. And now let's look at financing activities. Assume that we issued bonds for 150 and that we purchased treasury stock for 80,000. If there were no other transactions related to financing activities, issuing bonds, that's a source of cash, money coming in. Buying back treasury stock, I'm paying cash. They're giving me their shares of stock. Cash provided by operating, uh, excuse me, by financing activity, since it's a positive number, $70,000. So now we have our three sections, operating, investing, and financing. Let's take a look at the, the full-blown financial statement. Okay? Notice, every financial statement has a heading. ABC Company, December 31st, 02, Statement of Cash Flows. Cash provided by operating activities from the previous slide, 121,000. Cash used by investing activities, 62,000. Cash provided by financing activities, 70,000. If you add 121 minus 62 plus 70, the change in cash is 129,000. Now, notice, Beginning cash was 21,000, ending cash 150. The difference between beginning and ending cash is 129,000. The statement of cash flows explains the change from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, okay, as we've done here. So this is a full-blown statement of cash flows shown in summary form, okay? If I was to actually ask you to prepare the full statement of cash flows for each section, I'm gonna go back to previous slides, for financing, I'd want to see these two listed in the financing activity section. Investing, I'd want to see these two transactions listed item by item. And operating activities, which is the big section, I'd want to see all this activity. Okay? So again, we started with all this data, okay, including the difference between cash balances. Okay? And first, we figured out the operating activity section. Then we did the financing, uh, investing, excuse me, and we added, I added some additional information here. And then we had the financing activity section, okay, and here's what the financial statement looks like, minus the itemized activity. Okay, and there you have it, under the indirect method. And again, the only difference between the indirect method and the direct method is how that first section, the operating activities, is prepared. Investing and finance look the same under either direct or indirect method. Other issues for the statement of cash flows. We also have to address when the company has big transactions, and in accounting big, we use the word material or significant, okay? And so if we have significant transactions that don't directly involve cash, we still have to report this information. We have to disclose this information to the users of financial statements. So I'm going to give you an example of what we call a significant non-cash, since no cash is involved, investing and or financing activity. We're going to look at two different companies. Here's company one. Here's company two. Now company one has two separate transactions. First, they borrow a million dollars. Okay? Now, notes payable is a non-current liability. Therefore, this, I'm going to abbreviate, is a financing activity. Right? We borrowed money. Money came in, source of cash for a million. Then with that million dollars cash, we did this. We purchased a piece of equipment for a million dollars paying cash. Equipment is a non-current asset, therefore, this is an investing activity. And again, I have to abbreviate, investing activity. 
So we have a financing activity and we have an investing activity. Now, company two does this. They purchase a piece of equipment and they finance it. They sign a note payable. Debit equipment, notes payable. There's no cash involved here. So this transaction does not show up on the statement of cash flows, whereas these two transactions do show up on the statement of cash flows. But they accomplish the exact same thing. Notice here, debit cash, credit cash, it cancels out, and I'm left with a debit to equipment, credit to notes payable. It's identical. Simply the transaction was structured a little bit differently. So what we have to also provide if there are other significant non-cash, meaning no cash was involved, investing or financing activities, we provide a separate schedule and we list those things. So purchased equipment with a note payable, converted bonds into common stock, leased equipment, okay, no cash involved, uh, converted preferred stock to common stock, bought land, issued common stock, okay? Those are all significant non-cash investing and or financing activities, and we simply prepare a separate schedule to list those items since cash was not directly involved, but we could have structured it so that the transaction accomplished the same thing. For example, I might have bought land for $2 million and credited common stock for $2 million. Okay, and if you kind of apply the same logic, I could have issued common stock for $2 million first and then bought the land with cash for $2 million. Or if the person selling me the land is willing to accept common stock, I accomplish the same thing. Okay? So these are significant non-cash investing and financing activities. Second, I already mentioned that we don't analyze the current asset account cash separately because that's what the entire statement of cash flows is trying to explain. So don't include cash with AR and inventory, et cetera, or you'll end up messing up your calculations. Also, dividends payable. Dividends payable is a current liability. However, since the payment of dividends has, is a financing activity, we exclude analyzing the change in dividends payable from operating activities. Even though it's a current asset, dividends payable gets analyzed as part of financing activities, not operating activities. And then the last thing is, or not, excuse me, two more things. The next thing is if we use the indirect method, we also have to disclose how much money did we actually pay for interest on loans, and how much money did we actually pay for income tax, federal and state income tax. That has to be disclosed when you use the indirect method. And then last, there's, a, there's, in addition to the ratios we've seen earlier, which are based predominantly, pardon me, on the balance sheet and the income statement, we have cash flow financial analysis and cash flow ratios. And this isn't a ratio, but the term free cash flow is a cash flow oriented concept. And what it's telling us, first let's take a look at the definition. Cash from operating activities, literally, right off the statement of cash flows, that first section, cash provided by operating activities, less or minus capital expenditures, typically for property, plants, and equipment, replacing old equipment with new equipment, and paying dividends to our stockholders, which once we start paying dividends, they expect us to continue pay dividends. So once we've gotten, we've covered these mandatory expenditures to replace old equipment, to pay our stockholders, how much cash is left from our operating activities to reinvest back in the business, okay? It's a liquidity test, okay? It's a, how much, ca how much free cash do you have? Okay, it's kind of like analyzing the current ratio, working capital, same concept. What's left to put back in the business? Can you cover your liabilities as they come due and other expected payments? And that's what ca free cash flow is trying to tell us. Okay, folks, that does it for statement of cash flows.